Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is August 22nd of 1964. It's your boy here, William Sam Peterson. Recently, I conducted an interview with perhaps the most infamous black Muslim of them all. None other than Minister Malcolm X Shabazz. This right here is the interview that will blow your cahoots away. Minister Malcolm, let me be one of the first to say that I really appreciate you joining us here in our studio. I know you're a very busy man and uh, you have all these talks and you know, the civil rights thing, you know, you're trying to get the vote and everything. So I really appreciate you joining us here. But uh, so, um, I'm going to start this uh, by asking two simple questions about the Nation of Islam. Uh, first one is, uh, what society society believes that the Nation of Islam is a violent organization that, you, that creates or instigates violence, creates and instigates violence in order to achieve its goals. Uh, so why do you think that that exact same belief still persists in society today? And my second question is, uh, what is it that you are taught at the Nation of Islam? charge of violence against us actually stems from the guilt complex that exists in the conscious and subconscious minds of most white people in this country. They know that they've been violent in their brutality against Negroes. And they feel that someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto them as they have done unto do unto the whites as the whites have done unto us. We are a violent group. We do, uh, we are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be, to obey the law, to respect everyone who respects us. We're taught to display courtesy, to be polite. But we're also taught that at any time, anyone in any way uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us we are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. We never initiate any violence upon anyone. But if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. Yes, and I completely understand, you know, that point of the self-defense. But what, I'm, what, I, what I find really interesting, Minister, is that there have been many instances where unarmed blacks, you know, they have been uh, beaten up by police, sometimes killed. And uh, for example, you know, we have the uh, also the, the Birmingham bombings that, you know, they uh, happened last year. Um, but, you know, four, four little Negro girls were killed. Uh, and in none of those scenarios was there any retaliation, you know, or by, by your group, the Nation of Islam. So I think you should be happy. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean, I mean no, but, but, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that or don't you believe that you're contradicting yourself? But when you say that blacks should defend themselves against the white man, but then you have the Birmingham bombings, where, where, where it was the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, you know, that committed those bombings. And, you know, no, no retaliation on the part of you guys. So don't you think you're contradicting yourself there? As Muslims, we believe that separation is the best way and the only sensible way, not integration. And, uh, on, but on the other hand, when we see our people being brutalized by white bigots, white racists. Uh, we think that they are foolish.
are foolish. They, if they should have the right to, de to defend themselves against any attack made against them by anyone. I agree with that, Minister. I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, I mean, you just can't beat up someone just because you want it. You know, that person should have the right to defend himself. But what I wanted to ask is, should other black men help the, the person, the particular person being attacked? Should they help him? There will come a time when black people wake up and become intellectually independent enough to think for themselves as other humans are intellectually independent enough to think for themselves then the black man will think like a black man and he will feel for other black people and this new thinking and feeling will cause black people to stick together and then at that point you'll have a situation where when you attack one black man you are attacking all black men and this type of black thinking will cause all black people to stick together and this type of thinking also will bring an end to the brutality inflicted upon black people by white people and it is the only thing that will bring an end to it no federal court state court or city court will bring an end to it very interesting points uh minister but uh whoo! It has come the time for my favorite part of the show, Mr. X, and that is question bombardment. And so in this right here, I asked you four straight questions, Minister, and you have to answer them all. So my first question is uh, for you is uh, what do you, uh, is it of your belief that the laws in respect uh, to how Negroes are supposed to have equal opportunity and equal rights in this country not meaningful at all. The second one is, what's your opinion and attitude towards the civil rights movement? Then the third is, what's your opinion and attitude towards the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.? Fourth, the last one, by the way, uh, what's, what, do you, what do you think about King's philosophy to, of nonviolence through direct action? I mean, it should be easy. This just shows you the hypocrisy of the American white man. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. And uh, for this reason, we who are Muslims, that is, who believe in the religion of Islam, who believe in God, we don't believe that black people will ever get any laws, get any problem with laws being passed or uh, new persons being put in office, uh, white liberals being put in office. There is nothing that the white man will ever do to bring about uh, true, sincere uh, citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, Minister, that's uh, two questions. Uh, the other part of the other question was uh how do you feel towards Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and his philosophy of nonviolence through direct action? What do I think about uh King's uh, attitude? King's right hand man, uh Wyatt Walker, at King's convention, according to the New York Times on September the twenty sixth, said, We had quote, we have been duped meaning these persons involved in the civil rights struggle, of which King is the symbolic leader. His right-hand man says, and I quote, we have been duped, or have duped ourselves, into believing that the chains have been broken, when in truth we have only been chained more securely. Half freedom has in many instances been worse than no freedom at all. Why, don't ask me what I think about their struggle, 
I can tell you what they think about their struggle. And they, have, and they are, are, are pointing out that it is becoming more difficult every day uh, for the civil rights leaders to keep the masses of black people uh, nonviolent and uh, long-suffering and patient and keep them from becoming disenchanted. I hope that answers your question. Well, you know what? That actually does answer my question. Uh, so question bombardment is over. Now we move to like one by one questions like this one. So the Nation of Islam was an organization, as you very well know, founded in 1930. So that's 34 years ago. So it's been around for 34 years. But right now, it's like it's never been at this level, you know. I mean, along with the civil rights movement, the Nation of Islam is the hardest thing in the Negro community. But it wasn't like that, you know. I mean, in society, in society, I mean, we didn't even know what the Nation of Islam was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Nobody knew. But now, everybody, including your mama or your dog, everybody knows what the Nation of Islam is. So, and, and the membership, I mean, I've heard reports, I've heard reports that back in 1950, it was like 500 members, and now it's like 30,000. I mean, it's just unheard of. So my question is, what do you think are the causes that led to this sudden popularity and tremendous support that the Nation of Islam has garnered in the Negro community inside the last 10 years? When you put a seed in the soil, it remains beneath the soil until the season changes. And, and when the season changes, that the seasonal change automatically brings about uh, rather atmospheric conditions, bring about a seasonal change that makes that seed come up or crop grow uh, in its appointed time. And all over this world today, God himself, has brought about political uh, changes, a political atmosphere, sociological, social atmosphere, uh, economic atmosphere. These economic conditions, these political conditions and social conditions uh, combine to bring about a situation that is making black people in America more receptive, their mind more fertile to the seed of truth that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been planting for 30 some years and this is springing up today and causing our people to see and understand now what they couldn't see and understand before. Minister Malcolm, uh, to end this interview, I would like to ask you, in your opinion, or in the Nation of Islam opinion, what would be the ideal solution to the racial problem in the United States of America. So the only solution is separation. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that this can be brought about simply by letting our people be exposed to the truth about ourselves, about the white man, about our history and our condition in this country. And once we are exposed to the complete truth as things about things as they actually exist in this country, the masses of black people will choose complete separation from this entire system, political system, economic system, social system, and whatever other aspect or description you, or, or uh, uh, adjective you want to attach to it. Let us go back home to our own people, live among our own kind, and solve our own problems ourselves. And if the white man doesn't want us to go back to our own people and live in our own country, then since we can't get along together in peace on this country with white people, let us separate part of this continent, migrate to that separate territory, let the government give us everything we need to establish our own independent economic system and society, and thereby we'll be able to solve our own problems ourselves and prove that we are human beings and a part of the human family and can do for ourselves what other humans have done for themselves. And then we'll be able to stop blaming the white man for what he has done and stop begging the white man to solve our problems. We'll be able to solve our problems ourselves. Well, that was great, Malcolm. Uh, that will be it. Thank you so much uh, for coming. And, uh, you know, I wish you very good luck on uh, your upcoming projects. I hope you guys get to vote. And I hope that this uh, unfair racial oppression, you know, uh, eventually comes to an end. Thank you so much, Minister. Well, that is a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Those were my 15 minutes with Malcolm X. Next week, 
we have Martin Luther King Jr. to talk about Rosa Parks, Nation of Islam, the Civil Rights Movement, and much more. It's your boy, William St. Peterson, active 24-7. See you later, people.